This poor man cried to the Lord. And the Lord heard him. You know, the one, look at me. The one, I mean this. The one thing you've always wanted to say to God, it's stuck in your throat. I need to be somebody. I need to belong to somebody. I've got to know that this whole thing is not some joke. And I'm not stuck in some prison where no matter what I experience or where I am, it hurts, it disappoints, and it leaves me empty. So he grabbed God. I don't care if it kills me. And God said, you got to let me go because the sun is coming up. And he said, no, I won't. Not until I am a valid person. I'm not going to let you go. See, I'm going to tell you, you may think you want more money, but you really don't. You just don't know you don't. You may think you want the most beautiful girlfriend, but you don't. You just think you do. What you really want, you can't even put into words. It's stuck in your throat. I want to wake up and know that I am a valid, legitimate honest person with a valid life with a meaningful identity and a plan that works and a rightness and a peace what I want Mario is that thing called hope I want to get up in the morning and know I'm not having to get through this day so God warned him said, you better let go of me. No, I won't. Then the most confusing thing I've ever read happened. God touched the joint. The strongest joint in your body is your hip joint. He touched it and dislocated his hip. Ouch. I mean, three alarm, ouch. And Jacob wouldn't let go. And I'm confused because I'm sit thinking to myself, I'm holding somebody that has the power to dislocate my hip but can't break my grip on them. Because he wasn't being held to God by his physical power. He's being held by another power. A power can't, God can't resist. A power that the man in Psalm 36 understood. God cannot resist the sincere cry of a broken heart. I'm going to say it again. God cannot resist the cry of a sincerely broken heart. It isn't your arms that are hanging me here. It isn't your physical strength that is holding me here. It's your heart's cry. It's what you want. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14, I'm sorry, I threw a curve. I didn't give this to the folks that run the screens. But it said that a man's spirit will sustain them in their sickbed. A positive attitude will help you through an illness. But there's a comma there and it says, but a broken spirit, who can bear if you're sad, if your heart is broken, if your life is empty, that can be worse than any illness. It can be something that will have an effect on you that is indescribable. I know a man, and with this I'm going to close my sermon, at least the first of this sermon, because there's going to be another one. I'm sorry. You people are too kind. How do you sell your soul to the enemy? You become a tax collector where you're collecting money from the Jews and giving it to the Romans. And he sat at that table and his name was Matthew. There's a special kind of, kind of hardness of heart. 
He's got to have. Some of you have that too. I'm bitter. I'm broken. I'm angry. I'm disappointed. I'm devastated with life. And you're not committing instant suicide, but progressive suicide. By allowing yourself dangerous actions that you know will sabotage your health and your friendships. You're doing it on purpose. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at Matthew, the tax collector, like I'm looking at you. And there must have been a distance that he walked. Because I want you to imagine, here's Matthew. We don't know the levels of conscience he had to die to in order to become a tax collector. I mean, it's not like um, a woman cradles her baby and says to her son, I hope you'll grow up and be an IRS agent. <laughs> That's my aspiration for you. But the Bible says that he headed toward Matthew. Somebody's on the way to your seat. Somebody is on their way to your circumstance. Somebody is out in the back, ready, standing in front of you, saying, do you want this nightmare to end? Are you ready to stop hurting and wondering what's real and what isn't and what love is and what love is not? And that low-grade fear that's so indefinable that paralyzes you every day, you want to get rid of that? Nobody knew the private hell of Matthew. Nobody knew what was going on inside of his heart. Nobody but Jesus. And so when he started walking there, the 12 who are almost always befuddled are wondering, what's he going to say? And you could really gauge where you are with God by surmising in your mind what you thought Jesus would say to Matthew. One would say, how dare you? Um, didn't you see me curse the fig tree? You're not long, brother, because you have violated the most fundamental moral areas to turn on your own people. He was wrong. Maybe there was a, a seeker-sensitive pastor among the twelve. <laughs> Let's not be too rough on the boy, because we could use his tithe. And it goes on and on and on. There may have been a th therapeutic minister looking at him and saying, until you have analyzed his childhood, what right do you have to say anything to him? But Jesus did what no one was ready for. And he's going to do it under this tent to you, even though you're not ready. He went up to him and he said two words. Here they thought there'll be a diatribe or there'll be some apologetic, some glorious golden words that are so irrefutable that the logic of it would save Matthew. Instead, none of that. He said, follow me. And the Bible says that Matthew immediately got up and followed him. 